Okay, so we're in the middle of um, explaining Bitcoin design and have gotten to the point of ask of wanting there to be a um, global uh, published record of all the transactions. All right. Um, okay, and this is um, this uh, requirement is very similar to the requirement for certificate transparency from last week, and the um, the solution um, is somewhat reminiscent, although more sophisticated um, than certificate transparency solution. Um, and a name uh, we want a public log. This is often also called a public ledger. Okay, so how are we going to build ourselves a public ledger so that everybody agrees on? all the transactions that have already happened, and furthermore, they, they agree on the order of the transactions. Because if Y tries to send this coin to both um, Z and Q at the same time, you know, we want the first one to win and the second one to be ignored. And we want everybody to agree on which one, want, which transaction was came first and which came second and should be ignored. Okay, so um, how to make a ledger. So here's a bad idea. Um, well, a good idea, actually. The most simplest idea is to just pick somebody who everybody trusts and have that somebody uh, maintain the ledger for you. Every time you want to do a transaction, you tell the trusted entity what the transaction is. It just accumulates a log, and it's willing to give a copy of that log to anyone. So anyone can inspect it and see if a coin's already been spent. And that actually is a good idea. And if you could possibly do it, you should. Um, for various reasons, the Bitcoin designers rejected this very obvious, straightforward idea. Um, and the fundamental reason is that in a big system, in a worldwide system, there's um, unlikely to be any single entity that everyone trusts and that is indeed trustworthy and has no corrupt employees, for example. Um, and in a global system, you know, that means that we can't have the United States you know, government run the trusted entity because there's plenty of governments in the world who don't necessarily trust the United States, um, similarly for any other individual government. So really for a global system, there's no, um, it's, it's easy to argue against the idea of having a single central uh, trusted entity. So that leaves us with, well, we wanna run the system, make a system that's built out of mutually untrusting participants um, where we can survive um, malice by, you know, by the participants. Okay, so here's a, here's a bad possibility. Um, let's just uh, let anybody Let's build a system in which anybody can join. So it's gonna have thousands maybe of computers, we'll call them peers, they're scattered all over the internet. Um, and each one of them is gonna be running the software to, uh, um, for our new cryptocurrency system. Um, anytime somebody wants to um, have a new transaction, like why wants to um, uh, send a coin to Z, um, why, uh, floods their new transaction, sends their new transaction to all the peers. And you could send them directly or I mean, another design, which is actually what Bitcoin uses, is that Y sends the new transaction to a couple of the peers and then the peers forward it sort of over um, individual TCP links to um, the entire rest of the system. So now every transaction ends up being sent to all the peers and the peers, what they're trying to do is um, each of them maintain a complete copy of the log of all transactions. And what we really want is for all the peers, um, at least all the honest peers, for their transaction logs to be identical. They'll agree on which transactions exist and just as important on the order of those transactions. So how can we arrange for all these peers to end up um, processing the adding the transactions to their logs in the same order. And re you know, remember, of course, Y may have sent the transaction to Z, you know, to these peers, and at the same time sent its transaction to Q, um, to some other set of peers. Um, and we want to make sure that despite that, um, uh, the uh, peers end up with the same, with identical logs, even if Y is trying to trick them. Um, well, I actually don't know how to design this. <laughs> um, uh, one possibility that you can imagine um, is that the uh, peers would somehow talk to each other about each new, each new transaction and for each new slot in the log would vote on what transaction should fill that slot. Um, 
and have the majority, you know, since they may disagree legitimately if they receive different transactions, we have a majority rule that says, well, we're gonna, all the peers are gonna look at all the votes and um, the transaction that gets the most votes is the one that'll go in the next slot in the log and then they'll vote again on the next slot. Um, and, um, you know, maybe you could get this to work. Uh, you'd have to know who all the other peers are in order to know what a majority is. You don't have to know how many peers there are. Um, and you really want to make sure that you never count any peer more than once. Um, but in a completely open system like Bitcoin, actually, we can't do either of those things. We don't know how many participants there are in Bitcoin. And furthermore, the number changes all the time as people, uh, peers join and leave the system. Um, so we don't know how many peers are. So we don't know what a majority would be. Furthermore, we don't have a way to reliably count votes such that each participant only gets one vote. Um, even assuming that was desirable. Um, for example, we can't use IP addresses um, in order to decide distinct votes. We can't say, well, each IP address gets one vote or most one vote, because it turns out to be extremely easy um, to either forge IP addresses or by uh, breaking into people's computers to accumulate um, tens of thousands of, of real computers that you can control. And you, of course, would you can get them all to vote on your uh, um, can, you can get them all to vote in the system. So an attacker could probably accumulate a majority of votes relatively easily um, in a sort of straightforward design like this. And if an attacker can, can, can get a majority of the votes, then it can um, use this majority to sit to sort of um, say different things, conflicting things, but with the majority each time. So if Z asks the system, um, oh, you know, which, which, which of the two um, transactions came first? Because, you know, the, the member of the um, problem we're worried about is that Y is going to double spend some coin. So it's going to spend the same coin to Q, wants Q to believe that, and it's going to send that same Q's coin to Z and wants Z to believe that. So maybe when Q asks, what's the next transaction to log, the majority controlled by the attacker can say, oh, you know, why is transfer to Q is the very next one to log and that comes before uh, this transaction. And when Z asks, maybe the attacker's majority will say, well, you know, the transfer to Z comes first and this other transaction to Q um, comes second. Um, and that would mean the attacker can trick um, Q and Z into, ex into um, accepting the same coin. And that's a double spend um, and that's a disaster. So, um, without some very clever idea, uh, it's very hard to build an open system, you know, without a controlled membership. It's very hard to build an open system um, in which you have reliable voting. Okay, but in fact, um, Bitcoin doesn't quite use voting, uh, but it nevertheless manages to solve this problem um, of how to get agreement on a single ledger despite malice. Um, so this is the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and at this point, there's a lot of different blockchain systems out there. So actually, I'm not even sure what blockchain as a term refers to, but um, I'm only talking about Bitcoin right now. Okay, so the goal is we want agreement um, on a single transaction log, and again, because we want to prevent double spending. Um, and uh, this, we're going to be building, Bitcoin builds this thing called the blockchain um, that uh, contains all the transactions on all the coins. So there's a single, a single blockchain uh, that describes all the transactions in the system. Um, again, as with the previous system, uh, there's going to be many peers. So we still have this kind of overlay network of peers and each peer is kind of um, building a copy of the log. and it, complete copy of the transaction log in its own memory. Um, and uh, we don't know how many peers they are, or uh, how many there are, who they are, um, but they form a sort of, uh, one of these overlay networks by, with uh, TCP connections. And anytime a peer hears about a new transaction, like when Y wants to submit a payment transaction to Z or Q, it's gonna send it to one or more peers and that peer's gonna flood the transaction over the whole system. Um, the way the log is built up, the way the blockchain is built up is that 
Uh, each of the peers accumulates transactions and packs many transactions, thousands, into a block. Um, and then it's entire new blocks of transactions that are really appended to the ledger, again, um, by flooding new blocks over the whole system so that, at least in theory, every peer sees every new blocks. Um, so the uh, blockchain, um, well, the blockchains consists of blocks. What each block looks like um, is um, the hash of the previous block. And, you know, this is a bit like my um, uh, previous transaction, broken transaction system. So we have the hash of the previous block, um, the cryptographic hash of the previous block. There's a set of transactions. Um, so these are individual spends from, you know, Y is trying to pay Q or whatever it happens to be. Um, a couple hundred, a couple thousand individual transactions. And each transaction is actually much as I described before. It has the um, hash of the previous transaction for that coin, which is gonna exist in a previous block typically. It has the private, a signature by the private key of the previous owner of that coin, and it has the public key of the new owner. So this transaction would have, that transfers uh, money from Y to Q would contain, um, Q's public key and a signature by with Y's private key plus a hash of a previous transaction, a previous block. Um, as well as these transactions, there's a nonce, which I'll talk about in a moment. It's just a 32-bit number. Um, and then the current time, roughly. Um, the way the system works is that the uh, um, peers accumulate new transactions and roughly every 10 minutes, one of them produces a new block that should be the successor block containing um, all the transactions that have been sort of sent into the system in the 10 minutes roughly since the uh, previous block was created. Um, and if you're, uh, if somebody tells you they're paying you Bitcoin, then before you accept that they they've really done it, you need to watch the blockchain as it evolves. And you know, the blocks, new blocks are sent everywhere, so the blockchain is quite public. Um, if you think if somebody claims to have paid you, you need to watch the blockchain until you see a new block that contains the uh, transaction um, that you're expecting from the person that claimed to have sent you money um, and with your public key in it, and that looks valid, you know, correctly signed. Okay, so um, everybody, um, everybody has to watch the blockchain for payments to them. Um, all right, so who creates each block? Uh, this uh, action of creating a new block is called mining, and the technique that's used to produce a new block is often also called proof of work, um, in the sense that it requires a lot of CPU time to uh, produce a new block, and so the production of a new block essentially proves that you control um, a real live CPU and you're not just um, mining new blocks on a fake computer. Um, the uh, new block um, needs to, in order to be valid, a new block, when you hash it, has to have a certain number of zeros at the beginning of the hash of the block. Um, now, of course, if you just take a bunch of arbitrary transactions and you do a cryptographic hash on it, it's highly unlikely that the hash of some just whatever data is going to have more than um, one or two or three uh, zeros at the beginning of the cryptographic hash. Um, however, um, the computer that's mining the block can put any value it likes here for the knots. Um, and so what the mining computers do is that they try different value, different random values for the knots. Um, we'll just pick one with a random number generator. They'll stick it in their copy of the block they're trying to mine, and then they'll compute the hash on the block. Uh, and they'll check how many zeros, how many leading zeros are in the hash with this particular knots. Um, if it's enough leading zeros, and I don't know how many it is, but it's you know sort of on the order of dozens. Um, if there's enough leading zeros, then it's a valid mine, a valid block, and the uh, whatever peer it was that found this nonce that caused the block hash to have lots of leading zeros can flood this block over the network. Um, and you know, all that's being equal, that'll be the, the new next block in the chain. But typically, the, um, 
the hash of the block with any given nonce you know, won't have enough leading zeros and the mining, the peer will have to try another nonce, another random nonce. Keep doing that until it gets a, a block that hashes uh, to a hash with enough leading zeros. And so this takes a lot of CPU time. It takes, a, um, you know, it's a random process, um, but the system is sort of tuned and the number of zeros that are required to exist at the beginning of the hash of the block um, is set so that it takes about 10 minutes you know, with all the different peers, hundreds, thousands of peers out there who are doing Bitcoin mining, um, the average amount of time before the first one of them finds a nonce for a block that uh, has enough leading zeros is um, set up to be 10 minutes. Okay, so um, question, uh, how do peers or new peers discover other peers to communicate with? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So this is sort of a reference to the, this network of Bitcoin peers. Um, if I'm a new peer, you know, if I install a new computer, I get Bitcoin software installed on my, on my computer, and I want to join the Bitcoin network. Um, how do I know who to talk to? Um, and how do I know? Well, so the straightforward answer to that is that the Bitcoin software has built into it um, the IP addresses of a whole bunch of current peers. And so your software, when you first fired up, you know, the binary, the source, whatever, the Bitcoin software, you know, has a whole bunch of IP addresses in it. And you'll try to make uh, TCP connections to um, those existing peers. And if all goes well, you'll be able to connect to them and you'll say, look, I'm new, please give me a copy of the blockchain as it exists now. Um, and they'll send you the current blockchain, uh, which is about, couple hundred gigabytes right now. Um, so that's if all goes well. If all doesn't go well, um, then you may run into problems. Like for example, if your copy of the software has been modified by somebody malicious to have um, a list of IP addresses that are all controlled by the attacker, um, or the attacker controls your computer network so that regardless of who you try to connect to, you end up actually talking to the attacker's machines. It may be that the attacker is running you know, their own isolated network and that you, know, you think your newly installed software thinks it's made a bunch of connections to Bitcoin nodes, but whoops, they're all attacker's nodes. In that case, um, the blockchain you'll get will be a blockchain controlled by the attacker and you may well, you will be in trouble. Um, and uh, you know, there's, Bitcoin has some defenses against this um, uh, maybe the main, well, if you downloaded correct uh, Bitcoin software, the correct Bitcoin software has built in uh, hashes of recent blocks in the blockchain. And that means that if you connect to some attackers and you're running proper uh, Bitcoin software, um, at least the blockchain has to start with um, uh, you know, the first however many thousand blocks in the blockchain have to be correct. Um, if you download it absolutely wrong self or modified by the attacker, then uh, there's just nothing Bitcoin can do to help you. Um, and, and this is a potential weakness in the system. Um, I haven't necessarily heard of anybody exploiting this, but um, uh, it's definitely something to think about. Okay, um, back to mining. Okay, so the you, if, if you want to create a new block, you got to find a nonce that um, causes the, the new block you're trying to produce causes its hash to have lots of leading zeros. Um, for an individual machine, um, you know, uh, the amount of time for an individual ordinary computer to find a nonce that satisfies this requirement is like at least in the months of CPU time. Um, but there's uh, a very large number of Bitcoin miners out there. And so even though any one of them would take a very long time to find a new block, um, all we really care about is the time for the very first one of them to find a block. And since they're all making these sort of random choices of nonce, um, one of them is going to find a, a, um, a nonce that fulfills the requirements relatively soon. Um, and the number, Bitcoin adjusts the number of leading, required leading zeros in the hash um, in response to um, how fast new blocks seem to be appearing. And so if new blocks are appearing much faster than uh, once every 10 minutes, Bitcoin will automatically increase the number of leading zeros that's required, and that'll make it correspondingly harder and take longer um, for the miners to find a, a new block. And a block serve 
course, arriving slower than every 10 minutes over a sustained period of time, then Bitcoin will adjust the required number of leading zeros in the hash to be smaller. Um, and that means it'll be easier, quicker to find new blocks. So there's sort of an adaptive scheme there to uh, um, cause blocks to, new blocks to show up run, once every 10 minutes, roughly. Okay, so this is the um, proof of work scheme. And um, this is um, essentially a solution in a, in a funny way to the, uh, that voting problem I mentioned a few minutes ago where you can't really have, it's not practical to have majority votes because um, we're not sure who the participants are or how many there are um, because people may sort of create fake computers fake IP addresses, whatever it will. Here, you have to use CPU time, which is a sort of real resource that um, cannot be faked um, in order to contribute a new block. And that means that, um, you know, while it's not really a voting scheme, the what it's essentially doing is um, the new block gets to come from um, a ra effectively random choice over the different computers that are involved in, uh, in mining. Um, so this scheme is, um, it's a sort of a random, a sort of cryptographically reasonably strong random selection process for who gets to choose the next block. And so if there's a small number of attackers, um, they're highly unlikely to be selected by this uh, process in order to contribute the next block. Now what that means is that if most of the participants or most of the CPU power in the system is controlled by non-malicious people, then most of the new blocks will be found by non-malicious people. And that's not an immediate solution to double spending, but we'll see that it um, um, that it's the key to the double spending defense. Um, okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's go back to our example. Um, we have a, a, a blockchain that, um, Maybe it looks like we currently block five. Um, block five has been published to everybody. Um, the, uh, uh, the, all the peers are working on mining uh, a potential block six. And we don't know what's going to be yet because, um, uh, because the miners are still working on finding a valid nonce. But you know, we know that it has a bunch of transactions in it. Well, if at this point, why? Um, broadcasts, you know, say it's payment to Z, well, the, the miners are already working on this block. So uh, why is new transaction, even if it sends it out, it's now probably not going to be incorporated in the block that's been currently mined, but all the miners will kind of uh, keep this new transaction in a buffer on the side. And when one of them does find um, uh, a new block for block six, then Y's transaction will be incorporated into um, the attempts uh, to mine block seven. And as soon as somebody does mine block seven, uh, this Y arrow Z will actually be really in the blockchain. Um, all right, so, um, uh, so one question is, um, could there be two different successors uh, to block six? Could there be sort of a block seven and a block seven prime? Right. What prevents um, this structure from arising? And of course, the reason why we're interested in this is that if this structure could arise, then um, then uh, these two, maybe B7 prime, B7 double prime, um, then these two different B7s, two different successor, successors to B6, might have different transfers from YN. And so if you were aware of just B7 prime, you'd think why it uh, paid its Bitcoin to Z. If you were aware only of B7 prime prime, you, this would look like a totally legitimate payment from Y to Q. Now the question is, can there be two different successors to a block? Um, it turns out the answer is yes. And it's actually, it actually does happen reasonably frequently. Um, and the reason is that there's you know, thousands of uh, peers out there mining away trying to find the successors to block six, and they're likely mining, uh, you know, trying to produce somewhat different blocks with different sets of transactions in them. So it's easy to imagine a situation in which some of the peers, you know, they happen to see, you know, just because of the way the transactions move through the network, they happen to see Y transfer to Z first and they incorporate it into the block they're mining. 
and other peers, you know, for sort of the same successor to for the, their version of the block they're mining as a successor to six, just happened to have seen this transaction first and included that in the block. Um, so we can easily get different miners trying to work in a way, trying to produce different successors to B6. If two of them happen to find a nonce that satisfies the leading zeros in the hash rule at the same time, that means we have two different blocks, two different totally valid blocks produced at the same time. Um, and they're both going to send those blocks out into the network and uh, they'll be seen at you know, roughly the same time by all the other peers. So it could easily be the case that um, two different, two quite different uh, successors to block six may arise. Um, and this is called a fork. Um, um, and so we're very interested in what happens to forks because um, this can and does arise. Um, well, the most immediate rule is that uh, as soon as any peer sees a successor, um, all, you know, all the peers are trying to mine a successor to block six. As soon as them ever, any, of them, it, any of them sees a new successor block uh, be flooded from some peer that did successfully mine, um, it'll stop working on six um, and immediately switch to trying to work on a successor from B7, for B7. So initially, every peer, um, as soon as it sees a successor block, switches to mining a successor for that successor block. So in this situation, some of the peers will see B7 prime first and start working on a successor to that. And then other peers will start my, uh, will see B7 prime prime first, just depending on you know, what they happen to see first, if, the, if these two are mined at the same time, and they'll start working on a successor to B7 prime prime. So now we got some of the peers working on sort of extending this fork in the blockchain and the other peers working on extending this fork in the blockchain. Um, however, another critical rule is that um, if a, uh, um, if somebody's mining away on this, trying to make one of these blocks, and it sees a new block for a different fork that's longer, then anybody working on extending this fork will switch to extending this longer fork. Um, so it, that's a rule in the software that um, everybody is supposed to favor the longest chain. So at least initially, if we have some of the peers mining away on, um, one fork and the other, and they're the same length and others mining on the other fork, it turns out the variance in how long it takes to produce a valid nonce is pretty high. Um, so it's a, even if there's equal number of peers mining both forks, it's highly likely that one of them um, will find a successor significantly before the other. And so this successor will be flooded to a bunch of nodes, peers that were working on this successor, and they'll all switch to the longer fork. Um, and so that means that um, there, there's sort of an asymmetry here that causes um, uh, a, uh, a slight, you know, if, if this fork gets, ex gets extended by the miner slightly before this fork, then that'll attract miners over onto this fork. Um, and there'll be more and more miners mining on this fork. And so um, the new blocks will be found more and more rapidly on the winning fork. So there's a tendency to sort of reinforce success um, as the longer fork gets longer. And pretty soon, um, once all the miners have heard about this longer fork, nobody will be left mining on this fork. Everybody will ignore it and everybody will only treat um, this longest fork as the real, uh, as the real chain. Okay, so um, uh, there's this, it's highly likely that one of the, if there's a fork, that one of the two forks will um, uh, see a next block first, will be longer, everybody, all the peers will switch to mining on it, um, and that everybody will rapidly agree that one or the other is the longest fork. Um, of course, the transactions on the abandoned fork, um, you know, usually most of the, trans, usually the, these two competing blocks have you know, pretty much pretty similar set of transactions, but there may well be transa a few transactions here that were not there. And certainly if somebody's trying to double spend, there are. Um, but if there are transactions in the abandoned fork that didn't happen also to be in the uh, winning fork, then these transactions, um, they just go away. There's no attempt in the 
sort of blockchain system itself to try to carry over these uh, transactions now. Um, or there, or there's no attempt to kind of directly merge the two forks. Um, now, in fact, you know, if you don't see your transaction show up, you may reissue it. Um, uh, and, you know, because the blockchain is public, it will become apparent that your transaction needs to be reissued because it wasn't incorporated in the, for in the winning fork. However, it is also the case that um, for a brief period of time, both of these transactions were in the blockchain, right? So for a brief period of time, there was a double spending of Wise Coin in the blockchain. Um, and uh, that, you know, that's like a, a little bit of a dangerous situation. In fact, you know, it's an extremely dangerous situation, right? Since the whole point was to avoid blockchains, right? Until one of these two chains got longer, now, it was totally unclear um, which of these two chains to believe. And indeed, some of the peers may only know about one of them or the other of them. So um, this raises a sort of unhappy question about how Q or Z, you know, what procedure should they use to be sure that they've actually been paid? Right? Apparently, it's not enough for Z to say, well, as soon as the transaction appears in the blockchain, then I'm sure I've been paid. Because that's not true, right? Maybe the... Uh, Maybe this blockchain would end up being the shorter one and the Y pays Q blockchain will win. Similarly, Q can't just look at, oh, you know, my transaction showed up in this uh, block in the blockchain, therefore it's a valid transaction because it may end up being abandoned due to being on a shorter fork. And so this is the reason for the rule in that um, people who care don't really believe in transactions until there's a couple of blocks after them in the blockchain. Um, and as the, as the longer chain gets longer and longer, or as, as what you think is the longer chain gets longer and longer, um, the chances that there might be some other chain that will become longer and it, longer than it get vanishingly small. Um, because if you're on a slightly longer chain, that's gonna attract miners to mining on it. So no other chain can grow very rapidly. Um, and of course, the, you know, the rate at which a chain, a particular fork can grow uh, is proportional to the number of peers that are mining on that chain. All right. Um, and so this is, this is the mechanism that uh, prevents, that makes it so that if Y sends out two conflicting transactions at, at the same time, um, even though there can be a brief double spend, if there's a fork, it will rapidly be um, only one or the other of the two transactions will be in the longest chain. And so one of them will win in the sort of official chain. Um, now, and, you know, indeed, if, a, if this second transaction shows up, is sent to peers later on after the Y transfer to Z is in the chain, then um, all the peers will ignore tran or newly arriving transactions that for coins that have already been spent um, in a transaction on the chain, on the fork that they're mining for. Um, so why can't, you know, send out this transaction again after the first transactions uh, shows up in the chain in the blockchain okay um okay so you know there's some other attacks you might wonder about um uh, one question is whether um you know let's suppose that uh you know this is the this is the chain um if y is colluding with some peers and this is the official B7, and we have a B8, et cetera. You know, supposing Y is in league with some of the peers, could a peer um, take this block seven that's now you know, in the middle of the chain and change it um, to produce just a different block that doesn't have this transaction in it and just sort of substitute this new block um, for the old block seven and sort of pretend that block eight refers to it. And now block this new block seven uh, doesn't have the transaction. And so that sort of very straightforward changing of a single block um, doesn't work. And the reason is that these arrows here are really, uh, really means that there's a cryptographic hash in block eight that is the hash of the block seven it refers to. And um, so this hash in block eight, you know, for a, for a block seven that already exists, this hash in block eight is a hash of the original block seven. If someone changes this content, it's gonna have a different hash. Um, and so this block eight hash, um, if you try to pawn off this modified block on somebody who knows about block eight, they're gonna say, wait a minute, block eight's you know, hash doesn't hash to the same 
you know, block this block seven prime doesn't hash to the same value that's embedded in block eight. Um, so you can't trick anybody who knows about subsequent blocks into accepting a modified intermediate block. All right, question. Let's see, why is a Q store and buys a coffee um, and it shows up in one of the blocks? Oh, I see. Okay, so this is a, uh, let me just back up a little bit. Um, so I think the scenario we have is that, you know, there was a blockchain um, and then a brief fork. Um, and in that brief fork, Y paid the same coin to um, two different uh, two different parties. And um, let's say this is block seven prime prime, and it's block seven that wins and is on the main chain, and block seven prime prime is uh, is just forgotten and ignored. And the question is, geez, you know. For briefly, at least, Q saw this transaction show up in the chain and gave the cup of coffee to Y, and then Y left the store. But then, you know, this part of the chain is discarded, and Q is left with no money. They've given away some coffee, but they did not get paid. And that just is what happens in this scenario. All right. If Q was willing um, to hand over the cup of coffee after seeing the transaction in just the last block in the blockchain, then they risk this scenario, and there's nothing they can do about it and they can't get the money back. I mean, unless you run down the street and um, catch up with the person and take the cup of coffee away. Um, and that is the reason why for high value transactions, you know, Starbucks probably doesn't care very much, right? The cup of coffee really only costs like, you know, 50 cents to make. Like if they occasionally, you know, these forks don't happen that often, they occasionally lose a cup of coffee. Well, they can um, probably willing to deal with that. But if, um, if Y was buying a car from Q for you know twenty thousand dollars in Bitcoin, then Q probably would rather not uh, let Y walk off um, with this level of assurance about being paid. And that's the reason why, if you care, you'll wait until multiple blocks show up after the block in which your in which your transaction was in. So Z. Um, won't actually hand, if it's a high value transaction, Z won't hand over the goods until there's at least some number, five, six blocks showing up after the block the transaction showed in, up in. Um, and um, it's very unlikely that a, uh, um, a fork could be extended five or six times, like over a period of an hour now, can blocks show up only every 10 minutes and then turn out to be the shortest, not the longest chain. Because that means that there was some other uh, fork that was extending faster. Um, and the only way some other fork could extend faster is that if a majority of the CPU power is working on it. And we're assuming that a majority of the CPU power is, is non-malicious and is therefore switching to the uh, current longest chain. All right. So this is, you have to be, if you're doing large value transactions, you have to be careful. Um, and wait till the chain grows long after your transaction shows up. Okay, so um, okay, so I explained why you can't simply modify a, a block in the middle of the chain. Um, there's a related question, uh, which is uh, supposing there's an existing blockchain, um, you know, that's some amount long, and um, uh, your transaction y arrow transaction from y to z shows up here on the blockchain and uh, you want to get rid you want to hide that transaction now somehow make it so it doesn't exist well gosh why don't you produce a new sort of alternate chain um, that you know is mostly identical to the main to the real chain um, but it's longer and just happens to omit uh, Y's transfer to Z and instead includes Y's transfer to Q. And if you do the mining correctly for this and the hashes work out, your chain's longer and it just will be accepted under the rules of Bitcoin, which, which everybody's supposed to switch to the longest chain. So how come you can't do this? Um, and this, you know, this would also allow you to double spend by essentially unspending a previously spent quantity. And my earlier comment about, oh, you're supposed to wait you know, Z is supposed to wait until the blockchain gets extended. You know, this is now a way to defeat um, Z waiting for the blockchain to extend it. So we're really uh, be cause serious trouble if you could make this work. 
Um, okay, so uh, at some level, the answer is yes, this can be made to work. Um, and here's how to do it. You know, the main blockchain is being extended by the non-malicious participants at some rate, right? They have enough CPU power to, you know, produce a new block every 10 minutes. If you're the attacker and you have more CPU power than the entire non-malicious set of peers, then you're going to be able to generate blocks faster uh, than the real chain. So your block may, your, you know, chain may start out shorter and it may take you a while to generate each block, but, you know, maybe you can generate two blocks every 10 minutes, whereas the main chain is only capable of uh, generating one block every 10 minutes. And so that means after a while, uh, you'll have caught up and exceeded the length of the main chain, the main fork. Um, and by the rules of Bitcoin, everyone, you know, non-malicious, totally correct Bitcoin peers, they'll all switch to your longer chain. And that means they'll all effectively forget this transaction and accept uh, this other transaction, this second spend of the same coin. So if you're an attacker and you have more CPU power than the entire rest of the network, you can produce this chain and that means you can double spend. Um, and, you know, that's certainly, uh, you know, something to think about. Um, but uh, the reason why you might hope or be sort of somewhat confident that it couldn't arise is that in a big system with lots of participants, it might be very hard to assemble more CPU power than the entire rest of the system. So once, uh, once Bitcoin grew big, um, you know, people were somewhat confident that uh, the main sort of non-malicious system had enough CPU power, that it would be expensive for an attacker to assemble more CPU power uh, than the rest of the system. Um, of course, for new cryptocurrencies that don't yet have um, very large mining operations going, um, they're actually easy to shoot down. It's easy to, for a new cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. It's easy for an attacker, you know, for whatever reason, to put it out of business by um, getting more CPU power. But for a big system like Bitcoin, it's somewhat difficult. Now that said, the um, people who've looked into, tried to figure out who controls uh, mining CPU power in Bitcoin, um, suspect that the biggest players have uh, fractions of the total that are not that far from 50%. And that certainly if, you know, two or three of the largest mining operations uh, combined forces, that they um, would have a majority of the mining power in Bitcoin and could produce alternate forks like this. So uh, that's a somewhat troubling uh, development. Um, you know, whether they'd be motivated to do something bad, especially since sort of everything that's done in Bitcoin is public, you know, so people would really notice that Oh gosh, there was a long chain, and then we switched to a chain that started way far back. Boy, would people ever notice that. Um, and that would you know, destroy confidence in Bitcoin and may undermine anything that the malicious parties were hoping to achieve. So since you know, it is very expensive, actually, you know, the big players in mining and Bitcoin have spent a huge amount of money to buy the mining hardware that they own. And so they probably wouldn't want to undermine people's trust in Bitcoin because that would destroy the value of their vast collections of hardware. All right. Any questions about the machinery here? All right. So I have a couple of questions um, that I can ask and answer. Um, one question is that the 10 minutes between blocks is actually a serious annoyance. It means that if I want to buy something, um, it takes up to 10 minutes before the transaction shows up in the blockchain at all, even, even in the first block. Um, and you know, either I have to wait around for 10 minutes to get my cup of coffee, or the store owner has to give me my cup of coffee before the, trans, before the transaction's in the blockchain at all, thus having to trust me. So why can't we make... Um, the 10 minutes much shorter. Um, and, uh, you know, actually the 10 minutes probably could be made shorter. The practical reasons why it, it isn't shorter is that it actually, it takes a while for new blocks to be flooded over the system, right? After a miner finds the next block, um, you know, it has to be sent to thousands of peers in Bitcoin over possibly slow network connections. 
Um, and it may take quite a while before that block is known to all the other peers. And that means that there's some period of time um, in which other peers are mining on blocks or wasting their time um, mining blocks that are, are, have been superseded by a block that hasn't yet reached them. Um, and basically the fraction of time you spend um, mining, wasting your time mining blocks that have been superseded is related to how long it takes to mine each block um, compared to how long it takes to flood the block. And so if you make the interblock interval shorter and shorter, um, then it starts to uh, get small enough that it approaches the amount of time it takes to flood new blocks. And that would cause most peers to waste most of their mining effort. Um, and since the miners are actually making money, making Bitcoin by mining, because there's a little reward um, to the successful miner of each block, the miners are very uninterested in wasting um, resources, mining for blocks that are, um, have been superseded. Um, and so they're very uninterested in having this 10 minutes be much shorter than it is now. Um, and you know, that's a significant constraint. Um, so there's a question, what prevents Y from double spending much in a much later block when peers might have forgotten about the first transaction? Um, and so, you know, the question is, oh, you know, in a very early block, uh, Y transferred according to Z, and then you know, a thousand blocks later, um, Y tries to transfer the same coin to Q, you know, like a year later or something. Um, and the answer to uh, how this plays out is that uh, all the peers remember this forever. Um, they absolutely remember every unspent uh, transaction forever. And that means that, um, um, Actually, that can't be the full story. Like, I think nominally, uh, the, to tell you the truth, I don't understand all the ins and outs of this. But one way, to, the, the most straightforward way to solve this problem is for all peers to remember every transaction forever. Um, and every incoming transaction, they check uh, to make sure that the uh, coin hasn't been spent yet. They just, maybe the uh, course created database or index or something, um, but allows them to essentially check uh, every record to see if this coin has already been spent. Um, and I think you can, although I don't fully understand this, I think uh, peers can discard a lot of the, um, a lot of this information by only remembering information about unspent uh, transactions. So they keep a database of unspent transactions, but that doesn't include um, spent coins. And if a new transactions coin isn't in the database of unspent transactions, uh, then it's just ignored. Um, and, but this, you know, this database has to be, every peer has to keep this database uh, forever. So, you know, just, of course, this is a, in, in a way, a very expensive system because what we're talking about is, you know, maintaining a record of every transaction essentially forever. Um, and, you know, if you think about how many transactions there are per second or per year on earth, um, it's a vast number. Um, and so people really were serious about using Bitcoin. They used it for everything in the way they use cash now. Um, it would, uh, you know, it would be an enormous system and there would be enormous performance strains on the system. Um, and indeed, Bitcoin's not really capable of um, supporting every transaction. You, know, you couldn't run the entire financial system of the world on Bitcoin as it exists today. And there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of limits. Um, you know, one limit is that the full Bitcoin database already consumes a couple hundred gigabytes. You know, that's actually not so bad because you can fit it on a disk. Um, but if it was a thousand times larger, it would start to be a serious problem to even store it, let alone search for stuff in it. Um, the most immediate problem, anyway, it, it turns out that processing the transactions is not terribly expensive because for the peers, it's mostly about hashing and these cryptographic hashes are pretty quick. Um, but it, the sort of most, current you know ugly restriction is that these blocks there's a limit to how big these blocks can be these blocks can only be a couple megabytes in size and new blocks appear only every 10 minutes um, and so that means you only get you know less than a megabyte of new transactions per minute each transaction is sort of um well you know there's very way various ways of abbreviating them, but you know, each transaction is at least dozens or a hundred bytes. 
Um, and that means that the system can really only, uh, be, because of this block size limit and the 10 minute limit, the system can only process um, sort of thousands or tens of thousands of transactions. Uh, well, I'm not sure I can divide properly, but it's not nearly enough to run the, the current uh, way that Bitcoin setup is not nearly high capacity enough to run the world's, all the world's financial transactions are. And so, you know, people change it, it evolves, but um, uh, it's not really fast enough for everything. Of course, nobody's really using it for commerce. Uh, it's mostly used for speculation as far as anyone can tell. So it's not yet a problem. Um, but from a design point, there, there needs to be some things fixed. Um, okay, so I mentioned before that the Bitcoin software adjusts the hardness of finding nonces, that is the number of required leading zeros in the block hash, adjusts that dynamically um, to cause there to be uh, 10 minutes per block. Um, one thing that has to be the case though is that all the participants have to agree on the required number of leading zeros. They actually all have to agree on the hardness of finding a nonce. And so if one peer sort of looks at the rate at which blocks have been produced and um, decides that it's too slow and it should make the require fewer leading zeros, but the other peers haven't made the same decision, then that first peers will be generating blocks that are rejected by the other peers because all the peers demand what they think is the correct number of leading zeros in the hash. Um, so there has to be agreement on, on the hardness of finding a nonce. The, the, the peers have to agree exactly on what the current hardness is, otherwise they'll reject each other's blocks. So how do they reach that agreement? Um, it turns out actually to be uh, totally straightforward. Um, they all are looking at the same blockchain after all. That was the whole point, is that, you know, except for temporary forks, there's just one blockchain. Everybody has a copy of the exact same bits in the blockchain. And so the Bitcoin just defines a deterministic function that, that um, takes the current blockchain as its argument and uses that to deterministically produce the current hardness of finding a nonce. And the way it does that is basically it looks at the timestamps in the blocks um, to decide how fast the recent blocks have been produced. But since everybody's looking at the same blocks and the same timestamps and is running the same function um, to adjust the hardness, they all come to exactly the same conclusion about what the hardness ought to be for, for each successive block in the blockchain. So there's a kind of interesting agreement that's being enforced there because they all see the identical same logs. All right. Um, Another interesting question is that one of the motivations that some people have for being interested in new cryptocurrencies is that um, they might be more anonymous than credit cards. And indeed, credit cards are deeply non-anonymous um, since the credit card company knows exactly what you're up to um, and keeps a record of it. Whereas uh, Bitcoin, at least on the face of it, you know, Bitcoin, there was nothing about a Bitcoin transaction that say had my name on it. Um, now you might think, well, each Bitcoin transaction has my public key in it. Um, and it's true, if I don't change my public key, and I always use the same public key, then uh, once somebody figures out my public key is, which is relatively easy since um, whenever I pay somebody, they, they get to know my public key, then people can track my activities by looking for my public key or my signature um, in the Bitcoin log. And it's a public log, so anybody can look. Um, now people, uh, everybody who cares, and, and I think most Bitcoin wallet software actually generates fresh public keys for each transaction. Um, so that anytime, if somebody wants to pay me money, my wallet will generate a new, never used before public private key pair, remember the private key, and give the public key to the person who wants to send me money. Um, and that makes the tracking um, harder. Uh, but it turns out that um, if you're up against a determined sleuth, um, there's, you know, there's enough clues, if, if you make, transactions often enough, um, since the transactions are often tied to your real identity. Like if you buy something from Amazon with Bitcoin, yeah, maybe the Bitcoin transaction, it's not clear it's you, but it probably needs to be shipped to you by FedEx to your home address. And that's a little piece of identifying information there. 
um, and that will allow somebody to figure out it was you who spent that money and they'll be able to sort of track backwards to see where that money came from um, to get another clue about who you are and what you're up to. So in fact, um, against uh, amateurs, Bitcoin is reasonably anonymous against serious adversaries. A Bitcoin has turned out not to be particularly anonymous. Um, okay, so that's a, a little bit disappointing. From a little bit disappointing for people who um, are interested in privacy or doing drug deals or uh, financing illegal activity. Um, all right. Um, sum up uh, the sort of key idea here is the blockchain, a, like a public ledger that everybody agrees on and that uh, has every transaction on it. And while that has a lot of problems, like with scalability, um, if you can make it work, it's, it's a great idea. The, another sort of key technical problem is how to do this without any centralization. Um, now, whether the centralization or decentralization is a valuable property is kind of not really a technical question, um, but if you value it, then it's just really cool and amazing that it's possible to have agreement on a single log um, with no central trust and um, using participants, many of whom are actively malicious. Um, and the final key idea is that the, is that's the idea of mining, a proof of work, where it too has problems, but um, it's very surprising that a technique existed at all um, that allowed agreement um, in a way that can't be fooled by these sort of fake IP address attacks that doesn't suffer the same problems that voting suffers. Um, so that was a very surprising and interesting development. All right, um, that's all I have to say. The, we're actually uh, sent, kind of continuing some of this line of thought in the next lecture, um, which is a sort of different kind of um, decentralized system uh, partially built on top of Bitcoin.